Hi everyone. Welcome to a brief tour of Big Morongo Canyon Preserve. The Friends of Big Morongo Canyon Preserve sponsor an education program here at the preserve. Three docents from this program will take a walk with you through different parts of Big Morongo. Each will describe the features seen along the trail with a different emphasis of topic. The themes that we will explore are geology, animal homes and habitats, and how the Native Americans would have used the area that is now the preserve. My name is Jane. I've been a docent here for many years, and I've come to love all seasons and all aspects of the trails. We're standing in the kiosk near the parking lot. This is a very good place to start your walk anytime you come to visit Big Morongo. And you can pick up a map here. So there are maps and other kinds of information about what you might see on the trail. And then there's a large map here to follow. The kiosk also has exhibits containing information and pictures about many subjects such as birds, reptiles, insects, mammals, and geology. I will be sharing various geologic sites with you today, so let us look at the geology exhibit panel. This exhibit explains the earthquake faults that run along the various uh, parts of the Morongo Valley here. And then it also has pictures of the various geologic sites that we will be visiting on the trail. We will begin our tour with a view down Big Morongo Canyon from the top of Yucca Ridge Trail. This magnificent view has been created by millions of years of geologic history. Geology is the foundation for everything in an ecosystem. The geology of a place determines what is going to live there by providing all the elements necessary for every habitat. The geology of this place is responsible for the diversity of plants and animals that live at Big Morongo Canyon Preserve. The preserve has an incredibly special desert ecosystem because it has water. Most of our desert is dry because of the tall mountains that you see in the distance. Our wet weather pattern comes from the other side of those mountains. They're so tall that they block most of the clouds that would bring rain to our desert. Water is here only because of this area's geology. When rain does fall on the mountains in the distance, it seeps into the ground and travels across the Morongo Basin, which acts like a big bowl of sand. The two sides of the earthquake fault that run down the canyon and the eastern side of the valley have rubbed together for millions of years and formed a vertical layer of fine, waterproof clay. When that big bowl of sand is full of water, the water is forced to the surface by that underground vertical wall of clay. That happens at the beginning of the canyon. You can tell where the water goes and where it's spread out by the large trees growing below you and down the canyon. We can see a variety of landforms from here. Mountains, hills, canyons, washes. Changes in the geologic landscape usually occur very, very slowly and deep within the earth. However, the surface materials are subject to various forms of erosion water, wind, plants, and animals all produce erosion. We will visit a wash that demonstrates the power of water to erode. You might find it hard to believe, but we're looking at a bridge that used to have water flowing under it. Looks very dry right now, but occasionally there is enough water to move all the soil to fill the space under the bridge and over it too. As you came along the trail, did you notice the different sounds your feet make? Sometimes when the soil has very tiny particles and is soft, you can barely hear your footsteps. When there is gravel underfoot, you can hear a scrunchy sound. Look around you and take note of the plants that are living in the wash. Did you notice that there are different kinds of plants living here than the ones we saw living at the top of the ridge? The water washed much of the soil away here. Plants adapted to living in this exact condition can live here, but not as well on the ridge. The changed geology made that happen. This water erosion is a surface event. Let us go see some examples of rocks formed deep in the earth as you walk across the wash now. Listen to the sounds that your feet are making. This is really an amazing feature. Geologically speaking, what do we think happened to make this rock formation? The huge white part is called an aplite dike. It's much younger than the truly ancient rocks on either side of it. Let's look at the older rock, which is called gneiss. That's spelled G-N-E-I-S-S. -S. It is made up of several different kinds of minerals. 
Geologists tell us that the gneiss was formed over two billion years ago, deep within the earth, under great heat and pressure. 60 million years ago, there was a crack in the formation of gneiss that allowed the melted aplite to be squeezed into the crack where it quickly cooled. Again, this happened deep within the earth. We can see these rocks today because they made an exceptionally long journey. Over eons, the earth squeezed and pushed this formation towards the surface. No doubt, erosion played a part too. Then, a very short time ago, this area was exposed when a cut for a gas pipeline was made. Now, if you look down at your feet, you'll see different kinds of rock. One will look like the white aplite and will have flaked off the face of the dike. Note how sharp the edges are? Not much weathering has taken place. The white aplite that is collected in a pile at the base of the cliff is called a talus slope. It's loosely stacked, and if walked on, it shifts easily and can be dangerous to walk on. We always ask visitors to stay on the trails. One reason is your safety. The other reason is to prevent erosion by people. That would be a non-natural event in this very natural setting. Scrapes and trails heal very slowly in the desert. Now, notice the other colors of rocks at your feet and compare their shape with the aplite chips. Many are rounded. They've been eroded by water and wind. When you find a lot of rounded rocks embedded in soil, you're looking at an old stream bed. Just turn around to see one. Do you notice all the rounded, smooth rocks mixed in with the dirt? The stream bed that you are looking at has been estimated to be 100,000 years old. So here's a puzzle for the geologists among you. How did a stream bed get to be on top of a hill? Maybe you can guess. Once upon a time, that stream bed was on flat ground. Remember that this area has many earthquake faults. Over more years than we can easily count, that stream bed and all the area around us was pushed and crumbled like a piece of paper and the stream bed ended up on the top of that hill. The rock underneath the stream bed is more of the two billion year old gneiss. Be nice to touch the gneiss, don't you think? I can show you a place where the trail is right next to huge boulders of gneiss. On the way, we may see some other forms of erosion. Here, repeated trips down the hill to the water by animals is altering the landscape. During the next rainstorm, the animal track will become a stream and that will cause even more erosion. Well, here is an amazing rock. It's hard to imagine the geologic forces and the time needed to bring this huge rock to the surface. There are not many places on the earth that you can see this exact kind of rock on the surface. But as mighty as this rock seems, note the erosion is going on. The wind and water made a little soil in the cracks and the plants are beginning to grow. And now the plant roots will add to the effects of the erosion that the wind and water started. It's interesting to feel the different textures of the minerals of the rock. It's a good place to contemplate how even a huge rock like this one is not permanent. Note the differences in the plants around you from other places that we've stopped. You can walk across the fault line from here. You can't see it though. It crosses very deeply under the path this side of the wooden fence. Don't worry, it hasn't moved for 20 to 100,000 years. As you walk our trails, notice what is under your feet and the formations around you. See if you can see how the geology influences all the habitats found here at Big Morongo. Hi, I'm Cindy, and I'm at Big Morongo Canyon Preserve to invite you to walk around and look at some animal homes today. We're going to be detectives, so bring along your senses. What can you hear? What do we see? This is a big center stage for nature and homes are everywhere. So we're going to have to go slowly, keep our voices down, and it's best to be in smaller groups. That way you can sneak up and see the wildlife. Your first clue, the animals are much more active in the morning and at sunset. So it's early morning now, let's go. Big Morongo is like one big living room full of life. Animals use camouflage. Little ants and insects hide under the logs and leaves. One of the best ways to see wild animals is to look for their footprints or tracks. Can you guess who came by here? If you said deer, you're on the right track. 
Deer live at Big Morongo all year round. This is because they find food, water, and a safe place to rest. So this is the great-grandfather cottonwood tree. And though it looks kind of dead now, it at one time burst with life. There was a family of bees that moved in and the bees attracted another animal to the preserve. And that was a black bear. A big black bear came down this trail and ripped back the bark to get to the bees. And we know this because there's still some claw marks way up there. They're hard to see, but they're from the black bear. And so he was getting what he's supposed to get for breakfast. And that's a good reminder to us that sometimes bears do show up in the preserve and we need to stay on the trail and stay with our group. And most importantly, if we have a picnic, do not leave your food unattended. It's not a good idea for any of the wildlife to go dumpster diving and to get used to human food. It's really bad for everybody. So just keep your food supervised, eat it, and then put it away in your car and stay on the trail while you're out looking for the wildlife. Burrows are some of the coolest animal homes. By living underground, critters can stay cool in the summer and warm in the winter. I think of burrows as mini bedrooms or B&Bs where the critters can get a little place to hide and sleep and get their meals nearby. Look for tiny trails that lead to multiple burrows near shrubs and trees. Small ground squirrels can stay cool by napping in their burrow during the hottest part of the summer. They dig multiple holes near shrubs and bushes and often leave a visible trail. So check it out around the shrubs and trees. See what you can find. So Big Morongo is known as a birder's paradise because so many birds come here and make their nest. Some live year round and some just visit when the weather's good and there's food abundant. Up here, it's kind of hard to see, but if you keep your eyes open, you can see just a couple of nests, a bird nest. So we know that these guys were happy enough to stay around and raise a family. There's a little one here. It's just basically made up of leaves and sticks. And then back there was where the large Cooper's hawk lived. And the hawk brought in branches and leaves and made a great big nest. It was used every year for several years by different birds. It's kind of like uh, if you've ever shared your apartment with your neighbors next door. You live there for a while, then you move on and somebody else moves in. So these bird nests right now are not active, but when you come and visit, be sure and check out all the trees and look because you could find somebody at home in their nest. These days, wild animals are finding fewer safe places to build their homes, and that makes Big Morongo Canyon Preserve a super special place for wildlife habitat. How can we make sure that nature rules here and not humans? How can you be the best guest for visiting Big Morongo? Leave your pets at home. After all, it only confuses the wildlife when a domesticated dog enters their territory. This is a place where we only take photographs and leave only footprints. And by visiting the small groups and keeping our voices low, that will increase your chances at experiencing a true wildlife moment. We can all discover more about the desert by learning how native peoples lived here. And if you look closely when you visit, you too can begin to see how this special place is filled with everything people need to survive. We are standing on a desert hillside surrounded by more desert, but when you look straight down, what do you notice? This green oasis is a rare sight in this whole area, and it has everything people need. It's why the Native Americans made this place their home. Think about it. Think what animals and humans need to survive, and you can find it here. Let's go down and explore this special place together while we think about how Native Americans lived here before highways and supermarkets and modern technology, when the land itself provided everything people needed. The most important thing this place survives, and it feeds the whole community, is water. You've learned how water drains from the mountains into this basin and is both underground and on the surface. And that feeds the rich plant environment that this place enjoys. These plants are both food, they're medicine, 
and they're also building material for the Native Americans who lived here. And because there are so many plants, there are also animals who exist on these plants, and that could be food for the Native Americans as well. This place also is between the low and the high desert, and there's a canyon that connects the low desert to this place that the Indians could travel straight to it. And from leaving here, they could go into the high desert for other kinds of food and plants they depended upon. I'm standing in a forest, but it's not a forest of pine trees. It's a forest of mesquite. These trees may look scraggly, but this was the major food source for the Native Americans. There are pods that grow on these trees and they ripen in summer and they could be picked during the summer while they're still green to make a delicious drink that the Kui has made to refresh them during hot days. Or they could be dried and pounded into a meal that could later be used in cakes and taken with them or stored. Mesquite was such an important food that Native Americans told their seasons by the stage the tree was in at that particular moment. They had to know exactly when those pods were ripened and best to be picked. In places without mesquite, people could trade it for other foods that they might need. For instance, for oak and acorns from the oak in higher elevations. If you lived in a place with mesquite, you could almost be assured that you'd have food to both live on and trade throughout the year. To the Native Americans who lived here, all that the land provided had to be shared among the whole community, and there were rules about how first harvests were shared among relatives. The people realized that just as they depended on plants and animals for their survival, they had an obligation never to overuse plants and to share harvests with their families, with other animals, even with the insects who might bore into those mesquite seeds. This reciprocal obligation, this need to both thank nature for what it gave and to share it and make sure that it thrived was part of their ritual way of living in the desert. And it's why they protected the land as well as used it. The preserve is also home to yucca and cottonwood, two plants that provided other services to Native American peoples. The sharp-leaved yucca leaves were used for the strong fibers that are inside them. And once they were soaked and then dried, they could be woven into basket material and rope. The roots also had a substance that could be used like a soap for cleaning. These magnificent cottonwoods only grow where there's enough underground water. And even far away, you can see Big Morongo's hundreds of cottonwood trees and know that there's water there. Cottonwoods provided wood that could be used for mortars to pound that mesquite meal, and their leaves were used to relieve pain and swelling. So we have plant material for building mesquite as a main food staple, but what happened when someone got sick? Just as they did for food, Native Americans used plants and the powerful chemicals within them for medicine. Creosote, found here growing close to the mesquite, is part of this preserve and a very important medicine plant that was almost like our modern day penicillin. The Native Americans steamed it to help with coughs and congestion, and they also used it on the skin to heal wounds and prevent infections. Most medicines we use today come from the powerful chemicals that were originally in plants, and Native Americans learned how to use hundreds of these plants for different things like food and medicine. When you come to the preserve, it's a safe bet that almost any plant you see had some use for Native peoples. Native peoples spent their lives learning about plants, learning how they progressed and how to use them and how to protect them. And many of the Native American plants that were shared with Europeans when Europeans came to this country became our medicines and are still being synthesized today for modern medicine. Even though most of these plants have uses, we don't have generations of knowledge and training on how to use them. And some of these plants are poisonous. So when you come to the preserve, look, but don't touch. People can actually make themselves sick trying to use potions and medicines from plants that they don't know how to use well. And not only that, but people can over collect these important plants. So when you think about a group of people living here in nature, it's pretty clear that they had to rely upon each other. 
every child knew generations of relatives and people that lived far away from them whom they were related to. This was important because to say you were related everywhere meant that you could count on relatives in other places if your particular place had bad weather or something that prevented your food crops from maturing. In a place that has an environment that's subject to floods and drought, any extremes, having relatives everywhere is extremely important. And it was your obligation to share with them in times of stress. When you learn how Native people survived here, and when you come to this place and see the plants that they depended upon, you'll recognize that Big Morongo Canyon Preserve is filled with not just everything people need to survive, but to thrive. And this place was a very important home for the Native Americans for many, many years. Big Morongo Preserve gives us a glimpse into the lives of Native Americans in the past. But it would be a mistake to think that the people who lived and traveled through this area for thousands of years, like the Cahuilla, Serrano, Chemehuevi, and Mojave peoples are gone from Morongo Basin just because they no longer live as hunter-gatherers. Whether in communities or on reservation lands, Native Americans are important voices in our modern world, helping us to acknowledge and appreciate the natural environments that support us all.